My grandpa was going to say it. I was going to say it. Finally, it was a beautiful touch, yeah? That, that was worth coming alone tonight. It doesn't get better than that, so if you guys want to leave now, that's... I'm not going to do any better than that. No, but uh, we do come to hear from God and to hear that from God's Word. So and He spake tonight, not me. And you guys hear from Him. You guys have been here for any of my previous messages. I think this is number four. In my series, I've been going through in Colossians. Yeah, it's number four. We're just going to finish chapter 1 this week, uh, finally, um, verses 24 through 29. So Colossians chapter 1, verses 24 through 29. Uh, since I only go to about once a month, <laughs> I feel like we forget things. I forget things, so I'm sure that you guys forget things. Some of you may have missed messages as well. So I, I feel like we got to do a little bit of recap, at least reminder, like what, what has been talked about so far that really leads to what we're going to see tonight in Scripture. Um, but... The title, soft title here, um, not the super important. I don't think titles are too important. I don't want to, too much, I don't want to make too much of titles, but I think some of it is helpful. Usually I don't even include one. I don't want to make a big deal about it, but I thought this kind of summed up the whole thought of what Paul's going to be talking about tonight, and that is suffering for a cause. The big topic for tonight is suffering. Um, and we've all experienced suffering, maybe more, some of us more than others. So there's something to be spoken of here for each one of us. But as a little bit of background, what led up to this? Uh, all of the rest of chapter one is, most of chapter one of any book is really just an introduction, right? A lot of introduction, and this is a letter to a church, the Coloss, Church of Colossae. Um, so it's a letter to people, and he's addressing them and saying a lot of important things, at, you know, at, at the forefront, right? Not getting into the super deep theological things he's going to be getting into, but just kind of an introduction of things, right? So chapter one, uh, verses one through 23, everything up to this point, 23 verse, verses, They've all been a lot about, like, what does it mean to be a true living church, right? He's addressing this church. He's never even met, been to this church. Most of the people he's never met. This is Paul writing this. You guys didn't know that. To a church he's never been to. He only knows some key members of that church, like Epaphras and maybe a few others. We don't fully know, but for sure Epaphras, who was a member of that church and a local to that city, which is a lot like Hopeville. It's a small little area. Paul had never been there. He'd been to areas around it, a little bit bigger. Um but never there. So he's writing about what does it mean to be a true living church, right? Uh, a true living church is made up of people who are, are filled with faith, right? Spiritual faith, spiritual fruit. And he talks a lot about in this first several verses about what is like true faith. What is, what is the fruit of true faith? Not fake faith, not people who are just filling up few spaces, but true faith. What does that look like? Those are people, he, he describes people who... Um, acquire this true faith and this fruit, not through their own merit, not through works, not through coming and like, you know, just hanging out and just getting things passively, but people who have had a true encounter with Christ, right? Not other mediators. There was only one mediator. They were worshiping in this church a lot. They had a lot of problems. One of them was that they're addressing like in worshiping angels, right? It's like they're mediators. They don't need it. We don't need angels. We don't need a mediator. We don't need Mary, right? We have Christ himself. Why would we have another mediator between our mediator? Does that make sense? Go right to the source. He's saying all this comes through a direct relationship with Christ, the only perfect needed mediator in our lives. And that's how we come to true faith. That's how we bear spiritual fruit. Yeah? You talked a lot about this in these first 23 verses. So kind of hinted at a little bit and spoken about in the previous quite a bit, but if you haven't caught it, there's a lot of wrong thinking in this church. There's a lot of false teachers who are coming in. This is true of pretty much all churches anytime ever, but especially in the early church where people would come in and they'd twist the gospel, they'd twist the truth, and it sounded pretty similar, but there's a little bit different, and it caused a lot of strife in the church. And a lot of these letters were written to like, hey, correct these wrong thinkings, right? And particularly in this church, they had a lot of them, a mix of Gnosticism and pagan beliefs, which we can't go into too deeply tonight. But if I could summarize all that together, especially with what we're going to see tonight, what's the big theme? Um, these lies seem to entail some common themes we'll probably see today in wrong thinking in the church. Lies about who is God, especially who Christ is. Who is he? Is he God? Is he man? Is he mediator? Is he, is he greater? Is he less than? Who is he to us, right? If you think of any thinking, wrong thinking in any church ever, it always usually comes down to that as well, right? That's usually at the core of it. Another thing that's usually at the core, that was at the core of some of their beliefs was how do we come to salvation in him? How do we come to know him? How do we become made right in him, right? Is it through law? Is it through um, these mystic practices? Or is it through 
other things, right? And, and Paul's been saying it's through Christ and Christ alone and faith in him and nothing else, right? Notice like every single heresy ever comes out of those two things. Who's Christ and how do we come to know him and be made right with him, right? And they had a particular flavor that if you want to know about, go read it. You know, it's in there. Or you, know, you can go find some of my other messages. I explained that many times deeply, but it had a, a mixture of Gnosticism and pagan beliefs and ancient Judaic beliefs as well. But if we could boil those things down to one main, what's the main concern in the Colossian church with this false teaching? What was, the, what was like causing all this strife within them? It can narrow down to this. What is the scope? That is, what is the, like, the area? What is the breadth, the width of Christ's lordship over the universe and over our individual lives? How far does his reach go? How, how far does his control and his dominion and his sovereignty go in the universe, in the world around us? How far does it go in our lives? Is he a big God or is he a small God? I can't remember who said it, but someone once said, you know, big God, small problems. Small God, big problems, right? Christ is big. He, he's all, all sovereign over all things. This is what Paul is advocating. And the false teachers were advocating for a small Christ. So small that they, couldn't, they wouldn't even go to him. They couldn't even go to him because he was, in their view, flawed and he was imperfect. So they would go to the angels instead to, to reach God, right? Small God, they had big problems. Paul's advocating for a big God, big Christ, big Savior. Not so big problems. So, the answer, of course, to the question of what's Christ's lordship over the universe and over our individual lives, is that his lordship over these things is all-encompassing. It's comprehensive. There's no, you know, there's no dark corners where, where Christ's power is lost, Right? I think R.C. Sproul used to say there's no such thing as a rogue molecule in the, in the universe, right? There's nowhere out there that like something's happening where God doesn't have his hand of sovereignty over it. And that's good news if you can believe in that, right? And if you trust in God. I guess that's bad news if you're in rebellion to him. But that's good news to us in the, in, in the church, right? If we're true Christians. Christ's lordship is all-encompassing. That's what Paul's been advocating for all this time. So if Christ is Lord over your life, he's Lord over my life, it begs some questions, and this is what Paul's going to get into tonight. A lot of what is going to be natural fruit out of what he says for us. What, what can we mine out of today's passages? If Christ is Lord of my life, it begs two big questions that he kind of addressed already, but we're going to see more tonight. First question is, what is his plan and purpose for the world and for us? If he's so big and he's got all the, he's, he's Lord over everything, what's his plan? What's he got going on? How does that fit into my life? How does my life fit into that, right? Probably a better way of saying that. Now, what is What's God's plan for my life? It's like, what is God's plan? How does my life fit into that? What is that, right? What, what, what's the answer to that question? The second question is, what's our role in that purpose, right? I kind of already mentioned that, but what's his, what's his plan and what's our role in that purpose, right? He's so big and he has a plan. He's good and he's all powerful. What's his plan and how do I become a part of that, right? The answer is, he's already kind of addressed a little bit, actually. And the first one, what's God's purpose in the world and in, in our lives, was answered in uh, 15 and 20, verses 15 to 20, I should say, of chapter 1. We've already saw that, I think it was, was it last week? Well, not last week, but last time I spoke. And it's basically this, Christ's plan, his purpose is to redeem. It's to redeem. You can go back and read this if you want. Uh, verses 15 to 20. Actually, I think it's at the very end there. Yeah, verses 19 and 20. I'll read it. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and, verse 20, through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So his purpose is to redeem us and the world, right? That's his purpose. That's why Christ came. He came not to lots of other false beliefs in the church, even today, to make you happy. I mean, you will be happy in him because that's your purpose. We'll get to that in a minute. If you're, if you're following him and, li and living according to his purpose and you're a Christian, like you're going to find joy and happiness. But that's, he didn't come just to make you happy just to give you temporal happiness. He didn't come just to make you wealthy. He didn't come just to take away all your problems. Right? Actually, tonight, quite the opposite. That's what suffering is all about. That's not why he came. He came with a purpose, and that is to redeem us at a great price. And extension, the whole world. Not just you, but the all of creation. Right? That's the answer to the first question. Why did he come? What was his, what's his purpose? To redeem you, the world, I should say, and those whom he calls to himself. Second question, again, was what's our role? 
assuming, you know, us as believers, if we're believers in him, what's our role? And that's answered in verses 21 through 23, which again, talked about last time. You can read real quick. And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now, here we go, reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to, here's the purpose, to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. So what's our role and our purpose? Our role in this redemptive purpose is really the point of today's message. How do we model? How do we model what Christ has for my life? And I don't want to spoil that. We're going to talk about that tonight. And that has to do with suffering. That's a medium he uses to make us effectual servants for him. So to explain the purpose, Paul demonstrates in how one of God's primary methods for making us and transforming us into useful and effective servants in him is suffering. Yes? Okay, so let's read the scripture for tonight. It is uh, 24, verses 24 of chapter 1, 24 through 29. So let's read it. Now I, this is Paul, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is, in, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. In him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy, that he powerfully works within me. So, big idea. I like that. What's the big idea from today's passages? Okay. The big idea is that suffering is perhaps God's greatest tool for producing two things in our lives. It's a tool. It's not an accident. It's not something God's like, oh, that's horrible. Let me get you out of that. It's a tool. He's using this. And there's two major things. There's probably more, but there's two major things I think we see in today's passage, at least, that God uses this tool to produce in our lives. The first one is spiritual maturity in his church. It's not just about you, by the way. It's in his church, the church as a whole, to create spiritual maturity. And one, one big thing I, I, I see in this and I learn from this and I hope you see from this is that suffering isn't about you, even, and me, necessarily, the individual. Suffering is so much more about the community and the church as a whole. You're suffering. You're not going through suffering in your life right now just for yourself. You're going through suffering for someone probably next to you and around you. It's more than you and me. But Americans, we, we think of our faith as just me. And that's not really what faith is about. Faith is a community thing. And I, and I, I learned that reading this. I'm like, wow, that's not the way I was trained to think as an American. But it's, it is. So the, it's God's tool to produce spiritual maturity in his church. Yes, in you and me, but in the church as a whole. And two, to, gr- to produce growth in his kingdom. And by that, I mean... The kingdom of God in, you know, on earth and in heaven is people coming to know him, right? People growing in faith, people maturing, people becoming, you know, not just living on milk, but on the meat of God's word, right? People growing in faith and people coming to know Christ because of our faithfulness. So, you know, growing his kingdom is a very dynamic phrase, what I'm trying to say there, but there's a lot entailed in that, right? So two things again, to great maturity in his church, that's in maturity in, in believers, that we would grow in our faith, that we would not just stay babies and not like, you know, just not being able to dig in God's word and understand it and grow, right? But also that more people would come to know him and his, his kingdom and his dominion in the world would grow. Yes? He uses suffering to do that. Okay. So some big thoughts before we get into all this that come to my mind and maybe come to your mind or that we need to address because maybe we have wrong views of suffering. And I think if you're like me, you probably do because we, we all have wrong views of some of these things of God's tools in our lives. Instead of seeing our suffering as something that we need to get out of ASAP, we can look at our suffering like Paul did, right? And let me just take it back to before I get into that. How many of you, don't have to raise your hands, but think to yourself, when you get in something that's hard and you're suffering and you go to God, what do you pray for? If you're like me, you're like, God, please get me out of this, right? Maybe you make bargains with him. If you get me out of this, I'll be better, right? <laughs> or I'll do this, or I will be more faithful, whatever, right? Just God, get me out of this. Like we see it as something God's like, hey, get in check. Oh, I'm in check. Okay, I'll get you out of it. Like God's just like, it's like a warning. 
maybe he does use it as that like that sometimes, but that's not his primary use of suffering. That I think, at least that Paul's painting the picture up here. Paul has a very different view of suffering. Paul viewed it as purposeful. There's a purpose to my suffering. It's useful. It's good for something. It's going to accomplish something, right? It's effectual, right? It's not just like random. It's going to do something. It's going to accomplish something. And it's this is what's crazy. And this is going to take a while for us to get like this, like Paul. But worthy of appreciation. He appreciated his suffering. He was thankful for it. And this is wild. But he delighted in it. He had joy in his suffering. How many of us are like, yes, you know? And it'll like, why would I ever feel that way? Because Paul came to understand when God was putting him through something, something good was going to happen. And God was going to accomplish something that was amazing outside of his power. And he wanted to be a part of it. And that's, that's pretty amazing. We don't have that view. We're just like, please get me out of this, right? I'll do anything. You know, we make bargains. So you can think of your own life. I don't have to give examples of my life. I'm tempted to. But I don't have to. I think you have enough. Like, you can know your own suffering, right? So how can Paul say that? How can we come to say that? Because we can recognize that we, what we gain through suffering when we view it differently. We're gaining something in the kingdom of God, right? What we are gaining through it is of much greater value than what we will suffer because of it. Paul understood that like nobody else. And he had a totally different view of it. He was rejoicing. He, was, he had joy in his suffering. And we're just like, oh, get me out of it. Please, I'll do anything. You know what I mean? If you're like me at least. Maybe you guys are much more holier than me. But I don't think so. No, no, I think you guys probably are more holy than me, but I don't think you're so holy like you're Paul, right? None of us are like Paul, really, right? Very few. But we can be. I have three major points tonight that I think the scripture pulls out about suffering. There's lots of angles we could take in the scripture, because Paul's really just saying, like, hey, guys, I'm doing this as an illustration. I love you guys, and, I'm, and this is, I've been through all this because I love you, and I want you guys to come to know Christ more. He's, I don't know if, you know, the Holy Spirit has a plan for this, but I don't know if Paul's whole viewpoint here is to talk about, like, guys, you need to, like, be okay with suffering. But I just, I think this is so blaringly obvious when I read this, that like, man, there's something unique here about suffering that Paul is, life illustrates. I think there's three main things, three main points. The first one is what is the model of our suffering? Who do we model our attitudes and how we approach suffering after? Easy Sunday school answer, it's going to be Christ, okay? You can write that down now if you'd like. That's the first one. Who's the model of our suffering? How does Christ model suffering and how do we live up to that? Number two is what is the ministry that is produced through our suffering? How does our suffering minister to others around us, Christians or non-Christians? Number three is uh, what do we gain from our suffering? What is the gain in our lives through enduring suffering as Christ called me to? Okay. So what is the model of our suffering? What is the ministry of our suffering? And what is the gain from our suffering for ourselves and for others? Okay. So. Point number one, verse 24. Let's read it again. 24 says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. That's Paul. I rejoice in my sufferings, Paul, for you, the churches, specifically the church of Colossae, your sake. And in my flesh, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body. That is the church. So who is the model of our suffering? Easy answer. Christ and his suffering on our behalf is the model of our suffering. I just want to address a few things before I get into this. Like, it's, when you read this, you might think, like, what does Paul mean when he says, I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's suffering? What he is not saying is that we can somehow, well, number one, through our suffering, add to the merit, that is to the worth of salvation, beyond what Christ has already secured for us. Christ is all sufficient. If, if Paul was saying the opposite, he'd be arguing against himself. He's been saying Christ is all sufficient. And then he goes to say, but he's not totally sufficient in the most important area of his ministry. Like, no, that's not what he's saying. Right? And to prove this, we can just go a little bit further. We haven't got there yet. This is Colossians chapter 2, coming very soon. Well, maybe a couple months, we'll see. But he says, for in him, this is Paul saying about Christ, for in him, Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And here's the clincher. And in him, Christ, you have been made complete. So in Christ, every, like our salvation, every aspect of us and who we are and what we're meant to be is made complete in him. He is all we need, right? He's the model of everything in life of everything we need, of all of our deficiencies, they are completed in him and made right. Being complete in him, there is nothing that we can add to our redemption. Paul's not saying that, so let's not misinterpret that. He's also not saying that Christ's suffering was somehow itself deficient, not just that we can add to it, but that it was somehow not enough. Kind of adjust on the previous verse, but that he says more to prove this. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9, it says Paul, Paul's saying this about his own suffering. 
And because you're familiar with this verse, he talks about the thorn in his side, right? What does he say about that suffering? He says, this is Paul, and he has said to me, this is Christ, when he's like, he, he pleaded to God, saying, God, like, please take this thorn. Take this, this struggle away from me. We don't know totally what that is. They have some guesses, but he was struggling. He was suffering. He's saying, God, please take this away from me. I mean, it hurts. It's horrible. And what does Jesus say to him he's in Christ? What does he say? He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Christ is saying, basically, you're suffering, I'm sufficient, right? So we can't, through our suffering, be, make, you know, make Christ more sufficient. He is sufficient for all things, including our suffering. You guys follow me? That's not what Paul is saying. That's not what he So what is he saying, okay? What he's saying is we are, the church are called to suffer as Christ suffered. So Paul is suffering in the same way Christ suffered. We're actually guaranteed and promised that we will suffer, right? We're not promised. We're definitely not promised things are going to be easy. Things are going to be peachy keen and that we're going to be, you know, happy, no, no problems. We should be happy, but it's in spite because, in spite of our problems, because Christ is sufficient. We're actually promised we will suffer. Despite all that Christ suffered, think about it. This is not very long after Christ suffered and died. And, this, and then Paul and all these disciples are ministering and these letters are being written. Not too long after, they had just killed Christ. After all that the world had put him through, the world was still pleased to deliver more upon him. They're hunting these guys down to punish them, to put them, really to punish Christ, right? They're, they have still lots of vitriol ready to pour out upon Christ. So because of this unrighteous wrath, the world is just wanting to give Christ, even though they, are, they killed him, they murdered him, they're still wanting to give more. This is what Paul means when he says, I am filling up what is lacking. He's lacking saying like, there's still, there's still so much more to suffer for Christ's name. And I am doing my part to suffer for his sake. That's what he's saying. And that should be, the, the, that should be our attitude, which we're not there yet. If you're like me, you're not there yet. But that's a totally different attitude to suffering. Paul's like, hey, Christ went through all this. And then I'm going to do my part to suffer on his behalf as well. And he's like, he's, he's going to be talking about how he's having joy. And it, you know, this is... Like happiness through this. Totally different view of suffering. So again, the model is Christ, what he went through, what he did for us, what he is still going through for us in his name, right? That's our model. Anyway, that's verse 24. Verse 25 through 27 is the second point. What's the ministry of our suffering? What does our suffering serve to do? Let's read it again. Verse 25, of which I, Paul became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this ministry, this mystery, sorry, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So Paul, what is he saying here? His goal, what is his goal through all of his ministry and through his suffering? He says his, his goal is to take the gospel to unknown people, to the, to the Gentiles, to draw the Colossian church away in this context from all these false doctrines, right? He's going through all this suffering to take the gospel. and the, he's, in, he's literally in prison at this moment that he's writing this, suffering all this affliction so that they may be pulled away from these false philosophies, right? These false views of God. Also so that he could take the gospel to all the world. He's been traveling for, these, for years, right? He spent three years in Ephesus, which is just, you know, the distance of San Diego from us, away from Colossae. He spent three years there ministering so that all the, the gospel may go out to places like Colossae, like Laodicea, all these places in this area. So he's been laboring and suffering to take the gospel to these places. So his goal is to draw people, right? He says a lot of things here, like this mystery that is hidden, right? This is really apropos because these pagan beliefs, if you guys remember, if you've been here from the previous, not a briefly recap, but this, like, you know, Gnosticism and pagan beliefs are very much about like, hey, there's mystery out there and we can find it. This is super popular today, by the way. This is like not an old thing that's just faded away. Like this is super popular. There's so many kids, and I teach in high school, so I see it. But there's so many kids who are super spiritual, but not about God, not even about like other common religions. They're just very spiritual about like weird pagan things like rocks. They see like a little rock and they're like, oh, that's rose quartz, you know. I told you guys before, and they're like, Someone's trying to manifest something through this, with having this rock. I'm like, what are you talking about? And where'd you even learn that? And what does that even make, mean? Like, but they're very spiritual, right? Very like mystical. It's very popular. This is coming back, right? 
because it's mysterious and it's enticing, right? And there was no much less true back then. So they're very much like part of this pagan belief coming into this church was like, hey, there's like, there's mysticism out there. And like, hey, we have these secret societies. Literally, like the only way you can find this secret knowledge is by being part of our club. You know, this was a part of what's pressing into this church, as well as this other beliefs of like, you know, just complete paganism and like worldliness. It's just, you know, the characterized ancient Rome, ancient Greece. All this stuff is pressing in around. So Paul is saying like, hey, this talking about a mystery that's been hidden. Like the Christ like wasn't known to the Jews for all generations. The Gentiles had no idea that there was a savior coming. They're just living in their sin. And then bam, all of a sudden we're taking it to them and they're learning of it. And totally not expected. The Jews aren't even making up the vast majority of Christendom. They're a minority. But now it's the Gentiles who've been grafted in or now like, especially today, the majority of Christendom, right? Not expected at all. That was a mystery that was hidden for generations and it became known. And within a short time span of like 50 years, it's exploded through all of the world, right? To where Paul's at now. Like this mystery was hidden. But yet when it was revealed to the saints, he says this, mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints, right? It's became known. The Gentiles are now grafted in. That's what he's saying. And his goal is to take that into, through his suffering, and all the trials make that known to these people, right? Who are soaking it up. The Gentiles are like in their suffering. By the way, that's another part about suffering is when you're really struggling, you've got nowhere to go but up, right? You're hungry. The Jews were like very self-satisfied. So they didn't feel like they needed that. It's not hidden in the context that the pagans were like, oh, hidden knowledge. We've got to do these little weird things and have little stones and rocks and herbs and stuff. No. It was revealed in Christ, right? Christ was the revelation of all that. All that. And in particular to the Gentiles who had knew nothing about it. They're just living in their sin. All of a sudden, bam, here's this message of Christ. And they're like, wow. And they accept it. And it's just spreading like a wildfire through this, this area, right? We're, we're, we don't feel that because we live in America and everyone's just heard about the gospel. And if you talk about it, they're like, oh, you know, don't talk to me about that. How dare you? You know, and they'll report you and you'll lose your job. It wasn't like that back then. People were like, what is this? Message of grace and like reconciliation to God? Like totally different what they were that they were experiencing. To the Jews, it was clear from the beginning. They had all of this stuff. All They had the, the temple. They had the Ark of the Covenant. They had all this stuff, right? All, like God had met with them. Yeah, they, like for all is clear and obvious God made it. They missed him. They missed the Christ, right? They totally like just, they just missed it. Paul's saying like, hey, it was hidden for ages and it became manifest and just look what it did to the, to the Gentiles. And that, he's being a part of that, spreading that. So for us, what does this mean? That, that's what it meant for Paul, to suffer for Christ, right? What does it mean for you and me? We just need to, like, suffer in the same ways where God has put you and influenced you, right? God is going to put, there's, good, there's going to be suffering in your life, and God has an area of influence in your life. Maybe it's in your job, maybe it's in your family, maybe it's somewhere, right? It's somewhere. If you're a Christian, God has somewhere of influence. He's put you. So we need to know, for the Christian, suffering is never designed to be fruitless. I'm not just going through this. Because that's just the way the universe is, right? It's just bad luck. There is no bad luck. And it's not just because God's just like, hey, stop sign. Get in line. Okay, bye. You know, once you're in line again. No, it's for the purpose. And he's molding something. He's doing something. There's a big interweaving, the great weaver of, of all history. And you're a part of that. You're one of those threads. And God has your suffering in mind and a good and unique purpose. And it's probably not just for you. It's for someone around you. So... To prove this, let's go to 2 Corinthians 1, 3-7. I'll spend like a minute here. If you guys want to tell me, you can. But I'm just mostly referencing it. But I'm going to talk through it a little bit. First, sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3-7. through He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. You guys listening? It's talking about suffering, right? Who comforts us when we're in affliction, so that we may what? Comfort others when they're in affliction, when they're suffering. With the comfort that we, with which we ourselves are comforted by God. So we're taking the comfort God's given us and we're taking to the world around us, right? When they're suffering, we can, we have an answer. We have some comfort to give them. Not just like, I'm so sorry, that sucked. Let me sit here with you, right? That's true. Sometimes you just need to be someone just to sit there and listen to somebody, right? You have nothing to say. But really, we do have something to say as Christians. That God has a purpose for your suffering. He has a plan for your life. And that's enough, Right? That's all you have to say. Not probably more, but you get the point, right? That we don't, we're not just like, oh, let me just sit here with you. That's true. But man, we got something to say. And there's a purpose for your suffering. And it's not just like, you know, bad luck, right? It's not that. 
But there's more. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, that's what Paul would say, he's sharing in his sufferings, right? He's taking up and he's filling up what Christ didn't suffer for the sake like, of the gospel. He's, he's enduring that as best he can. But they, you know, Christ was dead. They still had more to give him. And he's, Paul's like, give it to me. For as they share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. Here's what I underlined and highlighted. If we are afflicted, as if we, like he's talking about the disciples, but us believers, us people who are overseeing you and ministering to you, if we are afflicted, it's for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it's for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in your, our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. There's this thing about this Christian community. You know, when you're suffering, I'm here for you. And when I'm suffering, you're here for me, right? Nowhere else you can find that, right? Not at least with the depth and the meaning and the purpose between, it's because what Christ did in our lives that we can endure this and minister to one another. So no, our sufferings are not, they may or may not be for our own benefit. And I mentioned this before, but I want to dive into this. Because we're Americans and we like to think of my struggles or my struggles. My faith is my faith. It's my journey. And that is not really what the rest of the world views when they talk about the church, right? I heard this on the radio a little bit. And I was just, and I heard, I, I, I had conversations with people that came up with this. It's just like God's just reiterating this point. But like the rest of the world doesn't view it this way. Like, you know, especially, it's just mostly first world countries. We think of my faith, my problem, right? But the rest of the world's like, yeah, this is like, we're a community. This is like, when you have a struggle, it's our struggle. We tend to be so self-absorbed that we can only see our own problems as ours. And that we may be suffering for the sake of others. That's why God has us in the suffering, to minister to somebody else. So when you keep it private, or if we don't like embrace it in the community aspect, we totally miss out on one of the, maybe the most major aspects of what God's trying to do through your suffering. The rest of Christendom has a firmer grasp on the reality that our faith is a collective thing. This means my struggles, that even means my obedience to God, my failures, my sufferings, and my victories, my services, all this affects the body of Christ, not just you and I, right? So I'm not coming to church because it's, it's not good. I mean, my family, uh, it's, I, we have something else we're doing. It's just affecting me. It doesn't. It affects the community, right? Like, oh, this is my sin. It's private. No, it doesn't affect me most. It does affect the church. It affects the community, right? And we can go to so many examples of that, but just I challenge you when you start thinking of it like that, really embrace and look at what God's word says about that, and it's not true. It affects the community. And this is a silly example. I thought, like, when I crush one finger with a hammer, the other finger, yeah, it teaches the other finger some wisdom. Right? So when one when one member of my community, when our church is suffering, everyone else learns from that, right? We have something to share. I'm just like, don't go, don't do that. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, like, God has equipped me now. I'm one step ahead of you. How to minister to you in your suffering. Because somebody who's one step ahead of me ministered to me in my suffering. Right? It's a community thing. So, our, that's our ministry through our suffering. It's not just about you. It's not just about me. It's about us. God has something to do with your suffering that's more than just, like, in your life. Though it's certainly something to do with your life, too. And that's really what we're going to address in the last point here. Verses 28 through 29. The point is, what do we gain from our suffering? What does the church gain from our suffering? It says, in him, him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. So this is what he's been building up to. All this suffering, all this the struggle we're going through, we're doing all this with one big purpose in mind. This is Paul saying, I'm doing all this so that I may present some believers, you guys, to Christ as Here's a gift of mature Christians that I have labored for your behalf, God, Christ. This is the flock you entrusted to me. This is what I'm returning to you. It's really like, it just harkens back to like his parables about like, you know, the talents, right? One was given, I don't remember, I don't remember exact numbers, forgive me, but you know, I was given, one was given a certain amount, it was like 100 talents, and you went and invested it, and we got 100 more. One was given 50. Am I getting the numbers right? Am I right? I'm so, okay. No tomatoes yet. No heresy. And then like, 50 was he he found a way to you know double that or something you know get a return on it and the last one was like got one talent and he hit it paul's like i'm taking my hundred talents and look god look what i've returned for you and this is all through my suffering what i've gone through for you what you've put me through has enabled me to produce this kind of fruit right 
for this I toil, verse 29, struggling with all of his, my energy? I love this. What do you say? Paul, I struggle with all of his energy, with all of Christ's energy, empowered by God, by the Holy Spirit, that he, Christ, powerfully works within me. This isn't even about what Paul's doing. Paul's like, I'm just, a, I'm just a vessel. God's doing this through me through his power. So what's our gain from our suffering? The main point here is that Christ's body may grow in spiritual maturity. He says that himself, right? That I may present you spiritually mature. So notice again that Paul's suffering for the sake of the growth and maturity of others in the church. He's not doing this because like God's trying to make me like a super apostle. I'm going to be, I'm going to be amazing. You know, I'm going to be like the most spiritual person in all of, you know, ancient Asia. No, no, that's not about Paul's like, it's not about me. This is like God's doing this and using me. I'm a vessel. I'm a tool for God's glory and for the salvation of many, right? And the growth of many. So likewise, Paul is striving and toiling not to be, not just to get out of this suffering. That's what most of us do. We're in suffering like, oh, I just got to get out of this, right? He's not just trying to get out of it, but to embrace it so that he may minister to the body. And this is just what came to my mind. And you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in I'm medical, you know, I'm in medical, I don't know what we call it, medical professional. I hate that. It sounds super snobby, but I mean, I'm medical. I'm in healthcare, right? And I just think like this. But I, I think of like, what came to my mind was the eye, right? I don't know if you guys mentioned about the eye. I love talking about the eye because it's the most amazing thing, organ in your body. But there's a lot of things that go wrong with the eye to have you in proper vision. And three things that came to mind, there's, there's two main, like, vision problems people often have. Why do you need glasses? There's a few more, but, you know, there's two main ones. There's one that's far vision. You've heard of this, right? And there's near vision, right? And far vision is called hyperopia. Hyper meaning far, like a lot, excessive. Myopia is like up close. Myo means like muscles, like strong, up close. So it means like myopia is like I see things good up close, but far off like it's blurry. Hyperopia is I see things good far off, but I can't read things up close. Maybe you know who you are, right? You got one of those problems. But I think of this, like, this came to my mind about our suffering. We can have one of those two views of suffering, right? I can be myopic and be like, in the moment, this is all my, this is everything right here. I, I'm just, I'm, I'm lost in my, in my, like, just uh, depression about it. And I'm just, I'm just so overwhelmed by my, my suffering that I can't see out of it. And I feel like I'm never going to get out of it. And I'm just in despair, right? I could be myopic. This is all there is. This is all there ever be. I'll never, I'll never be better, right? <laughs> my wife talks about this sometimes. And I don't want to share too many of my personal experiences, but like, the baby not sleeping, right? He's, he's exceptionally not a sleeper. Sometimes she's like, in the middle of the night, she's like, this, will, this is it. I'll never sleep again. <laughs> no, morning will never come. And like, that's, 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 example. that's, that's myopic, right? Like the sun, and we always laugh about this, but then the sun starts coming up, it always is like, I feel better. You know, like, even if you haven't slept, it's just magic how like the light feels better. But the point is like, that's myopic view. Like, this is it. This is all, there, this is all I'll ever be, right? And the hyperopic view would be like, I need to get out of this. I'm looking to the future. What do I got to do to get over there, right? I'm forgetting about right now. And really, the truth is, maybe, yeah, maybe that's more the guys, right? The fixers, like, we're going to, this is what we got to do. To get, and that's more me, like, well, we just got to do this and this and this, and this will, this is we're trying to get out of it, right? I'm just trying to get out of it. She's just, like, you know, struggling in the moment. And none of us can see what the purpose is of this sleepless nights, right? But the proper view, good vision, is called emetropia. And emetropia means, like, proportional or like properly measured vision. So that's like I'm seeing good distant. I'm seeing good up close. Everything's in proper proportion. This is how we should view our suffering, right? There's a purpose out there. God has a purpose out in front of me. And God has a purpose right now. And none of them is just to get me out of it or just to be in despair about it. God has a purpose through our suffering. So the question is, what does your suffering mean to you? Is your suffering like, oh, I just got to get out of it? Or is your suffering just like, God, just like, I'm in misery. I just not, this is all I ever will be. This is, this is it. I'm just, I give in despair. Or is it like Paul, just on a totally different spectrum, a cause for joy. He's excited. Like, is God's going to do something for this? He's using me. He chose me. Man, I don't view suffering that way, but I want to. Paul could rejoice in his sufferings because he knew they were effective, his sufferings. They were accomplishing their designed purposes because he's looking to Christ and he saw Christ through it. He looked to Christ as his model. He was serving Christ through it for the sake of others, right? And he had joy through that. Or they caused for grief and despair. What, where's our, what does our sufferings do for us? They cause for joy and, and, and invigorating. And he talks about the end of verse 29 about how he has this energy that powerfully works through him. When I'm suffering, I have no energy. I'm just like, oh. You know? But he's like, I have this power, this energy. 
Because Christ worked through me, he, just, he understood his suffering correctly, and he was like, I gotta, I'm going to make the most of it. And we could do the same. So when we encounter sufferings, let us do those three things. Number one, look to Christ and the Holy Spirit. Christ is the perfect model for endurance. He lived it. We could do the same. And the Holy Spirit is the encouragement in times of trial. Right? When I'm struggling, I look to him, and he's there, ever-present help in times of trouble. I'm looking to the purpose that God has for me, and I'm modeling that. Christ, how can I live like you today? Number two, let us embrace the ministry of our suffering. God has a purpose, and there's someone around you that's going to need it eventually. If not right now, soon, right? God has, God has a purpose for your suffering. It's not just, it's never for nothing. It's, it's meant to be exponentially, like, payoff, right? It has a purpose. Remember that your suffering is not just about you, but God has a design to use that for good and the good of his church, not just in your life. And this is where I've, I've always, you know, when we're, I, I personally know, when we're struggling through the sleep stuff, like we're, we're like, we're waiting from the morning, we're like, we just need to pray and meet the Lord. And we've done this, but like, eventually we've started to come to this conclusion, like God has something to do in our lives through this, right? Maybe it's to teach us to be more patient. We need to be more patient, more gentle. We need to be, and this is all true, but like what I fail to see is like, you know what? It's probably not even just about me. It's not about me and my wife. Like it's about so much more, right? We're going through these struggles. Like, I'm not even thinking about the fact that God has someone out there. Maybe this is a ministry opportunity, you know? Maybe there's someone out there who doesn't know him. It's certainly going through the same thing, and God's going to use that. And he's going to bring him on path. You know, I'm so myopic in my view, or so hyperopic, that I can't even see what God has me and what he has purpose there. So I'm going to miss out. I'm not, not being a Paul. Even when I think I'm being righteous, I'm not. And lastly, grow through our suffering. That we're going to be growing and gaining. We're going to be mature, maturing. In Christ, let's not waste the opportunity. Someone soon will need to need what God is teaching you now. And if we're not spiritually mature enough to have learned from that, we're not going to be able to give that, right? Number two on that is, likewise, you and I will grow as well as we rely on Christ. We're growing in faith, and he shows himself to be faithful, and our faith deepens. And the next trial comes, and we put our faith in him, and he shows himself to be faithful, and our faith deepens. And this is the cycle, right? I'm growing in faith, and I, he gets to... When I invest those talents, he gives me more and more and more responsibility. That's like, that's bad. I don't want more suffering. You know, this is secret for the kingdom of God. It's all worth it in this life. And we can have joy in it. It's not like it's that. It doesn't have to be miserable. And that's what it's like the world looks at. It's like, what's wrong with these people? I want to be in, you know, <laughs> somehow. They're crazy. How could they be having joy in that situation? It's only through Christ. All right? That's all I have for us this morning. Or this morning. <laughs> this evening. So, hey, I hope you're uh, encouraged and whatever suffering you're going through, because we always have suffering, right? May you view it differently, because I know I'm beginning to view mine differently. May God be honored and may people come to know him and be ministered and grow in him because of what God has you going through right now. Let me pray, and then surely we have music to close, and that's it. Thank you, God, for your word. Thank you for the truth of it, and just thank you for suffering father lord that you love us enough to do something with our lives not just to leave us the way we are but you have a purpose and that you use us and that you use things that also grow us and that lord you empower us and you equip us and you and you give us ways to overcome the struggles of our lives and it's not through just flesh and blood and uh, pure strength of just willing ourselves through the hard things father but it's through looking to you and finding peace in the storm Lord, we just pray that you would do that in our lives today and you'd help us to remember in the times of trouble that it cannot always be night and the day will surely come, Father, and that we may we be looking to you so we may be equipped and ready to make the most of it and that we would not be ashamed on that day that we did not make the most of what you had given us and the talents that you had entrusted to us. May we be honored in that. We pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen.